Welcome to Beyond the Data. I'm Dr. Phoebe Thorpe, and here with me today is Mr. Scott Montgomery from the Food Fortification Initiative. Thank you for joining us. Today's session was about neural tube defects and preventing them globally. Neural tube defects are uh, devastating birth defects of the brain and spine. And we have known for a while that folic acid um, can prevent neural tube defects. Uh, but it takes um, fortification in flour, uh, which is done through milling. And you're a miller. So how did you get from being a miller into global fortification efforts? Okay, well that takes me back to about 2004. And at the time I was the vice president of operations of Cargill's global wheat flour, maize, and rice milling businesses. And the CDC visited the Minneapolis headquarters of Cargill. And I was invited to attend that meeting. At that meeting um, from the CDC was Bill Dietz, who was the, at that time the director of mm -hmm. uh, nutrition, um, physical activity, and obesity. And also a, a gentleman named Glenn Maberly from Emory University was at that meeting. And Glenn was the director of the Food Fortification Initiative. At the time, it was called the Flower Fortification Initiative. Um, and Glenn had spent years in salt iodization. Mm -hmm. Probably traveled to China a thousand times and just globally worked on salt iodization. And the one thing he recognized, salt iodization really took off when the private sector was joined in the effort. So Glenn could not say two sentences without saying public-private relations or partnerships. And so I asked Glenn, who's your private sector representative? And he told me, he said, actually Cargill should be. So Cargill joined, the, at that time, the Flower Fortification Initiative. And I joined the board or the executive management team. And then about a year later, I was asked to be the chair of the, board, of the executive management team. So that, that was through 2010, and then I retired from Cargill after 30 years in multiple jobs and businesses. Uh, and I had to replace myself. And I talked to the uh, CEO of the largest milling company in Southeast Asia. And he said, yeah, I'll do that. He said, by the way, why don't you come and work for us? So I had passion for the work, mm -hmm. but no time mm -hmm. at Cargill. And I said, sure. So I began, became the industry liaison. Mm -hmm. and, and then shortly after that, they asked me to be the director. director. So years and 30 years in the private sector, my goal was to make money. Now I wake up every morning and my goal is to eliminate the burden of micronutrient deficiencies by adding um, vitamins and minerals and particularly folic acid to cereal grains to prevent spina bifida yes. as an example. Mm -hmm. so and neural and tube defects. From the session today, we, we heard that it isn't just, you're right, it isn't just about the millers and industrial. It's also about finding where things work and where you can push things forward. Yeah. Um, and your group has looked at a number of different countries to, f to try to figure out where that is. What are some of the factors that you looked at when you thought you could have the most impact in the short run? Um, First and foremost, I would say political will. That's, that's a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. um, so the ministers of health, always champions of the cause. But that's just one isolated silo in that government structure. So we need buy-in from the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Industry, the Minister of Finance. And even more importantly, if we can get the executive level support from that country's government, then we can build the political will. We also need champions who understands the incredible benefit of doing this, the very low investment to do it, and they can push that mm -hmm. internally in that country. Yeah, I remember uh, the quote you had from the Miller it, yeah. about just so, so little money and so much good. Yeah, I, I said was... enduring value, um, minuscule costs, and tremendous benefits. Yeah. Um, the second thing, once we have the political will, we need to understand supply chain and the, the consumption of those cereal-based mm -hmm. grains in that country. So we do um, analysis of supply chain. We try and understand the consumption patterns, who's eating what, 
and what the industrial milling complex is and how many people we can reach. Mm -hmm. There's no sense fortifying staples that are not widely consumed. Sure. And then I'd say third, um, once you understand there is political will, that it's doable and you can make a significant impact on the population, then you need a private public civic um, team to work on it, in-country team. Mm -hmm. We can supply all the technical support they need, leveraging global knowledge and experience. The local team has to make it happen on the ground. So, yeah. And um, in the session today, we heard about uh, an effort in Tanzania that is what I would consider a more local effort. It's a little bit different. It's working with smaller and medium-sized mills, but it also had a big component of education and creating a market for the fortification because that's a it, that's the other side of supply and demand is it's a it's a it's a it's a pull demand sure um, I would um, the the easiest way for me to answer that is to compare the large industrial milling um, mm -hmm. f and mandatory fortification to the small mills so on large industrial milling complexes that reach a large portion of the population and fortification is mandated we reach the people. They mm -hmm. consume those staples and we reach the people and they consume that fortified staple food. Uh, there isn't a tremendous amount of s consumer marketing, so to speak, needed mm -hmm. because they're, they're consuming it. Sure. Um, that being said, the, the millers need to properly label that, that um, flour or rice, whatever is being fortified. And we do encourage the governments to at least you know, educate the population that this is good, mm -hmm. this is good stuff. In the small mill environment, the consumer education and marketing can be much more critical because you have hundreds to thousands of these mills. And for the governments to monitor and, and ensure that all those mills are in compliance with the fortification standards, it's difficult and it's very costly. But if the consumers can be educated and demand from those suppliers, we want this fortified maize flour as the example in Tanzania, and, and they label it and put logos on it to identify it, that can really um, help that program be impactful and effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I know we've, we've had a lot of success, because you, you bring out it's 97 NTDs, neurotube defects, a day that are prevented by fortification, the fortification that we're doing now. But there's more to do. What, what else is to be done? 97 a day is a great success story. That being said, we're not near where we need to be. So we estimated approximately um, 35,000 neurotube defects are prevented, current fortification, mass fortification there's an opportunity to add 165,000 to that. So that's the opportunity fortifying industrial milled grains. Mm -hmm. So yes, we celebrate for uh, the success and it's a great story. We have a long ways to go. Yeah, but it sounds like uh, five times, you could do five times yes. more what you're doing now. Yes. And I, I heard from what you said and from the session, it's, it's, not, it's not hard, but it's complicated. Yeah. And so it's doable, but it takes a lot of thinking through and planning, and, uh, yeah. it's, but it's doable. And I look forward to when we have accomplished that. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for joining us for Beyond the Data. See you next time. <laughs>